Good morning. Welcome to First Presbyterian Church, Alsa, Alabama. For those who are watching us online, we are a member of Warrior Presbytery and the Presbyterian Church in America, and we welcome you as well. Uh, the first thing I'd like to do today is to say that we, as a church, offer our Christian sympathies to the family of Ann Atkins. Uh, she went to be with the Lord this week, and she served this church for a number of years as pianist, organist, and choir director. Uh, I did not notice any announcements that I needed to make in the bulletin, but I do need to announce that there will be no Vespers tonight. And are we doing a prayer meeting Sunday night? I mean, uh, Wednesday night. I, I didn't know whether he decided to do it or not. So just check online. He may be on, he may not be. Okay, okay. Okay, good, thank you. All right. All right, would you please stand as we have our call to worship. Today we're going to read from the Word of God from Revelation chapter 19, verses 5 through 7. And a voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. As I heard, as I were the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice, and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself. Please take your hymnal, turn to page 164, and we will sing, O oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, we humbly come before you to worship and adore you. We come with praise and adoration for thy gracious mercies. You have given us gifts far beyond all measure, which we do not deserve and have not earned. We lift our hearts to you. We thank you, God. We now continue our prayer 
by using the words that Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us now profess our faith in our living God by reciting the Apostle Creed. Christians, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, the only Son, Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the life of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, I'm going to ask Ruling Elder uh, Everett Owens to come forward and lead you in the Psalter reading. You'll be turning to page 788, Psalm 16. As Tommy said, this is Psalm 16, and we'll read it now responsibly. Keep me safe, O oh God, for I, I take refuge. I said to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. As for the saints who are in the land, they are the glorious ones in whom all is my delight. The sorrows of those will increase who run after other gods. I will pour none in salvations the blood or take up their names on my lips. Lord, you have assigned me my portion and my cup. You have made my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is by my right hand, and let me be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad, and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure, because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence with eternal pleasures in your right hand. Thank you. <laughs> At this time, we will uh, go before the Lord with our prayer of thanksgiving and praise. And for that prayer today, I'm going to use Psalm 138. Dear Lord, I thank you, Lord, with all my heart. I sing praise to you before the gods. I face your holy temple, bow down, and praise your name because of your constant love and faithfulness. Because you have shown that your name and your commands are supreme, 
You answered me when I called to you. With your strength, you strengthened me. All the kings in the world will praise you, Lord, because they have heard your promises. They will sing about what you have done and about your good, good glory, great glory. Even though you are so high above, you care for the lowly, and the proud cannot hide from you. Dear Lord, we pray these things in thy Son's name. Amen. Please take your hymnal, turn to page 347, and stand as we sing, The Church is One Foundation. We'll only sing the first four verses. be seated. Our pastor Derek Bright is on vacation this week, so we're honored to have as our guest speaker today Will Webb. All, most everybody here knows Will because Will served as our youth director for several years. Uh, he has been attending Reformed Theological Seminary and he has graduated with his degree in counseling. He can tell you a little bit more about that. I think he's had some experiences and uh, we welcome Will to our uh, pulpit today and he will complete the service. Thank you. Will.
Good morning. If I didn't if I didn't say hi when I was walking around a minute ago, I'm sorry I missed you. Um, it's good to see everyone. I, it's good to see to see a few new faces too. Um, although I think I, I think I've recognized most of y'all. Um, yeah, I did just uh, finish uh, up with RTS. I just want to I wasn't going to talk about that, but I, I do want to mention that that y'all have been um, supporting me through that uh, prayerfully and and financially and. Um, I've just finished up with that uh, in May and graduated, and now I'm lined up to get a job at a uh, at a facility in Arkansas, a Christian facility working with um, young men dealing with a lot of addiction type stuff. So, um, if you want to know about that, uh, I can tell you more later. Um, but yeah, just thought I might like to hear that. It is good to see you, see all of y'all um, this morning. I didn't realize we were going to have such a such a uh, scripture heavy service. I, there's a lot of scripture in the in the service. Um, that said, we're about to read a big chunk. Uh, I I kind of debated about whether or not I, I wanted to read the whole of John six uh, for the sermon, um, but I finally settled on that. Yeah, we're going to go and do it. So it's I timed it out. It's about seven seven and a half minutes long. So just buckle down. Um, see what did I want to say here um, it might help you to kind of think about it being divided into um, roughly three sections the first section is where Jesus goes and feeds the 5,000 and it's right after that he uh, there's a very short miracle where he walks on water and that's kind of a like a bumper transition and then you move into where Jesus is talking about what it means uh, that he fed the 5,000 and curiously enough he never actually mentions the walking on water. So there's a lot of speculation about what that actually means from all the co different co commentators I read. So um, we'll mention that, but only brief briefly. We're not going to go into that too much. Um, and then it ends on this kind of third, short, final section of how do people respond uh, to Jesus and what he's saying, both what he what he did in the feeding of the five thousand, and what he says it means for him as the Christ. Um, so yeah, we're going to read the whole thing. We're not going to, going to go through it verse by verse because I have appointments later this week and we'd be here just forever if we did that. Um, let me pray for us real quick and we'll jump in. Um, Lord, thank you for this time that we get to come here together to examine your word, to have our hearts examined by it um, so that we might know you better. Uh, Lord, I pray that as we read, um, we would see not just things about you, but that we would see you and that we would um, come to know you better and that it would deepen our relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. John 6, verse 1. I'll be reading from the ESV. Um, so follow, follow along in whatever uh, version of the Bible you have. After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Lifting up his eyes, then, and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Jesus answered him, Two hundred denarii would not buy enough bread to, for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, and Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, about five thousand in number. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed, he, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, Gather up the leftover fragments, that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled twelve baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Perceiving then... They were about to make him come and take him by force to make him king. Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. 
It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were frightened. But he said to them, It is I. Do not be afraid. Then they were glad to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. On the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there, and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum seeking Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not labor for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, Then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from, the, from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in, in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him, him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father." that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So the Jews grumbled about him, because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, Do not grumble among, among yourselves. No one can come to me, unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. By God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me, not that anyone who has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Speaking of himself, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. The fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven. A little better. Um, truly, truly, I say to you, picking up in verse uh, 47, whoever believes has eternal life, I am the bread of life. Is this thing working? No. Okay. All right. Uh, your fathers ate the man in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed amongst themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. 
As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught at Capernaum. When many of his, his disciples heard it, they said, This is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to him, Do you take a, said to them, Do you take offense at this? Then what then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascend ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life, the flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life, but there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. And he said, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. After this, many of his, of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, Do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. And that's where we're going to end the reading for, for today. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God shall stand forever. And this is the word of our Lord. Um, so let me open with what might seem uh, an odd question. Um, I know some of you are business owners. Uh, some, some of you have children or grandchildren. And, uh, you know, if you're looking for someone to hire or uh, you're looking for trying to try to look at who who this who this person is who your who your loved one is is seeing uh is a significant other have you ever stalked anyone on facebook or looked them up on google just to see what comes up kind of look through some pictures kind of see what they're like uh just get some general impressions um yeah you can get to know a lot about a person by doing that um i saw i saw where somebody had done that and they they pulled up a, a whole list of things, and they started to, kind of as an illustration, um, here's, here's uh, Jim Smith, uh, and he's got grandkids, and he's kind of got these political leanings, and, and he did this for vacation last summer, and, and I don't know this person. I just looked him up on Facebook. And the, the point is, you can get to know a lot about a person um, by looking them up online, uh, kind of reading up on them, doing, doing some research, um, but there's a big difference between learning about someone and getting to know someone. Um, and we can do the same thing with Jesus by reading the Bible for information like it's a newspaper or a resume. And, and of course, that's not how we're supposed to read the Bible. But bigger than that... Um, we're not hiring Jesus. Um, and I bring that up because I want to I want I want to kind of get you into a frame of thinking about um, knowing Jesus, not just knowing about Jesus this morning, but knowing Jesus and being known by Jesus. But also I want to kind of bring that up that idea of hiring Jesus up because that's essentially what the Galileans here do. Um when they see him miraculously turn five loaves of bread into enough bread for 5,000 men, most likely with additional women and children there as well, um, they see this, this huge you know, box checked off. This is somebody who can, who can provide for the masses. They would make a great leader. Let's make him our leader. Um, and I mean, really, that is a that is a good qualification. You want you want a leader who can take care of who take care of their people. Um, and they see that that he could, you know, by virtue of this miracle, they see that he could provide for their physical well being. And in addition to that, you also have the the healing miracles uh, th that that they're already following him for. Um, now the question is, can Jesus provide for their physical well being? Yes, he can. And can he provide for yours and for mine? Yes. 
Is that primarily why he came? To provide for our, for our physical well-being here on this earth? No. Um, and I don't, I, don't, I don't want anyone to come away from here thinking that I'm saying that Jesus doesn't consider your physical well-being important because he does. That's, that's evidenced by his daily upkeep of the world, of all the things we need. Um, or that our appetites are unimportant because those things are things that, have, that God designed us with. God designed us to be hungry. God designed us to know when we need to eat, to know when we need to be, um, know when we need to talk to a friend, you know? Um, he created, he created us with sensations that indicate to us when we lack, when we are lacking something, and he daily sustains us through rain and harvest, and he provides not just for our needs, but also for our comforts. And those things that he provides for us, whatever they are, are good gifts. But here's the thing. A really good gift can make a really lousy idol. And what Jesus came to do primarily is to pull the idols out of our hearts and replace them with himself. And anyone, anyone who comes along and tells you that what Jesus came here to do is to make you happy, healthy, and wealthy at the very best, they've severely misunderstood Jesus. At the worst, they're a charlatan trying to, trying to get something from you. Because Jesus didn't come to help us do the things we were already doing, just do them better. That wasn't his goal when he came here. When Jesus came, he came intending to make you into a new creation, not to make you a better version of your old self. He came so that you could be born again in him. So, to kind of illustrate this, I want to go to John 4 um, and look back at when Jesus went to Samaria and he met the woman at the well. Because he spoke to her, to her of living water and she asked him to give, her, to give her some. And he told her to go bring her husband. She told him she didn't have one. She, he said... That's right, you had, you've had several, and the man you're with now is not your husband. And when he does this, he dives down way. She wanted something that would allow her not to have to go out in the middle of the day and pull water out, and so that she wouldn't have to deal with the shame of possibly meeting somebody out there. Um, but what Jesus does is he graciously exposes her shame when he tells her that, because what Jesus knows is that unless she begins looking to him to satisfy her desires, unless she becomes, begins looking to him to, to make her whole, she'll never have that. If she keeps doing the, th the same thing she's doing, the same things she's doing, she'll never be satisfied. She'll never be, she'll never have what she wants. And, and ultimately that that's part of this, is that the deepest desires of the human heart aren't satisfied in things. They're not satisfied in, they can't be satisfied by the relationships in this world. Ultimately, they have to be found in Jesus. Um, and he knows that. And, and oftentimes, you see in the scriptures, what Jesus does to get there, it, I mean, he, he really gets under people's skin. He really upsets their expectations. And when we look at our story today, Jesus feeding the 5,000 and his explanation of that, you see Jesus over and over again digging the knife in a little bit deeper and upsetting expectations a little, a little more. Um, the Galileans, um, they wanted to make Jesus their king. And the text actually says that they were going to force him to be their king. And he, he perceived this and escaped them. Now think about this. You can earnestly call Jesus king and never taste the bread of life if you're trying to make him king for the wrong reason. And it's easy, really. Just start making Jesus into a, uh, a Democrat or a Republican. 
make him into a capitalist or a socialist. Start tying some agenda to Jesus. Um, just start following Jesus because he's useful and he can provide what you want and you've missed it. Um, and the Galileans also call Jesus um, the prophet. And that's, and that's uh, I don't know if it was capitalized in your translation of the Bible, but it was, it was capitalized in mine. And what they're saying there is this person who would make a great king because he can give us what, what we want because he's useful to us. He's, he's like the prophet. He, uh, um, and those things are both true. And what they're, what they're talking about there is the Old Testament Moses, the person who would lead them out of bondage. And just give you a little historical, historical context. At the time, uh, Rome is kind of the ruling power over the area. And there's this expectation that when the Messiah comes, what he's going to do is supplant the Romans and create again kind of this golden age of Israel like you had under King David. And Jesus is upsetting that expectation because what Jesus is concerned about isn't, isn't temporal. It isn't, it isn't earthly. It's, it's something bigger. And so whenever they call Jesus the prophet, whenever they call him, say this, this person would be a great king, they're not wrong. Um, but they miss what it means for him to be the true Moses, for him to lead his people out of slavery. Because they're thinking of slavery to Rome, and Jesus is thinking of slavery in the heart to sin, going all the way back to Adam. Um, the Galileans' understanding of those realities the way the Galileans understand that, they twi it twists Jesus into an image of their choosing, thus falling far short of the, good, gr of the true goodness of the Christ who came to save the world. The next day when the Galileans catch up to Jesus, um, they're amazed that he has evaded them. And they say, uh, they say how, did, how did you get here? Um, and Jesus sidesteps. He didn't answer that question because he's not going to give in to what they're what they're trying to get from him. Um, instead, he he perceives that what they want from him is just make more bread, fill their bellies again. And Jesus Jesus responds, "Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves." And they they wanted they and they ask explicitly for another sign, but what they don't understand is that the sign. Isn't isn't the end in itself? All the miracles miracles of Jesus, save the resurrection, they're all pointing us to the divinity of Jesus. They're all pointing us to a Savior who is more glorious than a bunch of bread, who is more glorious than a bunch of wine, who is more glorious than being healed from an Ill illness. Not that any of those things are bad but that Jesus is so much greater, so much better. Jesus being the true bread of life um, means that he didn't come here to fill bellies. He came here to save souls. And the gift wasn't the bread. The gift is Jesus. And you and I need to recognize that too. That the gift isn't isn't better relationships. It and then there are a lot of different ways people people can uh, talk about the the benefits of being a Christian. There's there's a real there's a real sense in which following after Christ together and being sacrificial with one another, being the image of Christ to each other does result in better relationships. It results in satisfaction. It results in oftentimes a community being more whole and, 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 and sometimes a, a, commu a community being more wealthy. Any number of benefits, but those aren't the gift. Um,
Do you see Jesus as precious, not just the things that he gives? Do you see Jesus as precious? Because that's what the Galileans miss. They're presented with the greatest gift the world has ever seen in the person of Christ himself come to come to love them, come to do like he did. We'll come back to this again later and get in, get in the boat with the, with the disciples. Because he came to get in the boat with us. John, John 1 opens, the word was with God. In the beginning, the word was with, with God and the word was God. And he came to dwell, to dwell among us. Literally, he came to tabernacle or to pitch a tent among us so that he could be with us. Don't miss Jesus for the world, all the flashing lights and fine homes, 401ks and boats and fields and whatever, whatever else you can lay your heart on. Jesus stepped across the stars to make you a child of God. And Paul says, even now we're seated in heavenly places with him. In a very real spiritual sense, if you're here as a follower of Christ, you're seated in heaven with him right now. Um, when we become like the Galileans following Jesus because he can make us happy or give us good relationships or make us rich or any other reason our hearts can dream up that isn't following Jesus because he alone is lovely, he alone is precious, he alone is worthy and glorious. When we follow Jesus for any reason other than Jesus, his loveliness, his holiness, we become like the uh, the child. Many of you have probably read, read, read a lot of C.S. Lewis. He talks about a child who goes to the beach with the family and won't leave the parking lot because there's a puddle in the parking lot and it's fun to play in the puddle. And he has no idea that just across the sand dunes there's a whole ocean. And whenever we become enraptured by this world, the things that you can love here, and there's a lot of good stuff here. Whenever those things catch our, catch our eye and begin to consume us, and it's easy, we miss the ocean. That there's a whole ocean of goodness in Jesus Christ himself who came and died on a cross for us to be the bread of life for us so that he can make us whole. Um, Jesus, Jesus tells them this, that he is the bread of life and that he's come down from heaven. And they become offended. Because for the Galileans, Jesus isn't complying with their expectations. He isn't being the savior, the king, the prophet that they thought he should be. And what Jesus does is he doesn't back off. He doesn't say, oh, well, maybe I can be a little, little gentler here and... and, and kind of slowly ease you into it. No, what Jesus actually does is he doubles down. Um, and uh, I'm just going to read out a list of the things that Jesus claims that are increasingly frustrating to the Galileans following him. Um, he says that only he has seen the Father, and that the Father sent him down to this earth to give life. He claims not just to be a prophet like Moses, to be, to, but, to be a greater, but to be greater than Moses. That Jesus is the, is the one who actually gives the bread. And essentially what he does when he claims to be coming down from heaven, and that he's the one that gives bread, is he's claiming to be God. And you see, by, by the response of the people and by Jesus' response to that, they kind of get that. They get that. They get what he's saying when he says, "I've descended from heaven." And they say, "Isn't this the Jesus who we knew from? He's, isn't he the son of Joseph, the son of Mary?" And Jesus says, "No, those things are true, but I'm the son of my father." And some grumble and some leave. And then Jesus doubles down again. He says that he's saving those who the Father gives and that even believing takes an act of the Father drawing someone to Christ. And he says that to have true faith, the people must eat his flesh and drink his blood. And 
this is one of those points where you can see that there are some people, it says that the, the people following and listening, they discuss amongst themselves what he's, what he's saying, and some people clearly think he's talking about cannibalism. But it's also clear that there's a significant number of people who get the deeper message here that he's not talking about literally eating him, but he's talking about that the Messiah must die, that his blood must be poured out. And um, and this whole, the, all he's doing here is he's laying out what he has to be as the true Messiah. What the people expect is somebody who come in and, and conquer conquer the land and, and make them free and make them rich and make them happy and and for Jesus to save souls he has to go to the cross and you'll 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 remember that whenever later on even the disciples struggle with this the idea that Jesus must die because Jesus is is very explicitly laying out not in metaphorical language he says I must die and Jesus says no or, or Peter says no you won't die and Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Because even, even the disciples don't get it. They struggle with this idea. And we have the benefit of the cross. We have the benefit that we understand what Jesus was doing, being our atoning sacrifice. Um, but if you look at the church, across America, across any, any you know, Anywhere that you can see the church, you see people who, who still miss it. And I pray that you don't miss it. I don't want you to miss Jesus because he didn't heal that person. Or because maybe you lost a lot. Maybe, maybe, maybe you lost a bunch of wealth. Or maybe you, maybe you will at some point. And I don't want you to miss Jesus because those things become too important. Um, because those things are those things ultimately pass away, and what what we're looking forward to is the day when Jesus truly does restore us, truly does make you wealthy and beautiful and happy, and um, makes all your relationships perfect. When we're with Him on the other side of the grave, while we're here now, what Jesus is doing is reaching down into your soul, and like a wound, cleaning out the stuff that needs to be cleaned out. And he's filling it back up with himself. Taking our bad blood out of us and putting his blood in us. Um, when Jesus is saying all this stuff, when he's, when he's giving out the bread, um, I don't know if you caught this in the very beginning. The miracle happens and he gives this sermon um, around the time of the Passover. If you look at the kind of the biblical calendar, it's the next Passover and Jesus is hanging on a cross, a, actually doing the act of atonement, actually taking on the sins of his people. When he's having the whole wrath of God poured out on him, so that his people can be made whole, can be made righteous, can take on his righteousness, his good works. Um, I'm going to read the very last portion of this chapter again, because this is this is how how the people respond. Some people hear this and they leave. But watch what Peter says. When many of his disciples heard it, they said. This is a hard saying, who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, Do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to the Father unless it is granted him by the Father. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? 
We have you have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. How do you know if, if the Father is drawing you to Him? To this, to, how do you know if God is drawing you to Himself this morning? How do you know that? Right, because that's in there. That's Jesus says that. Only those who, who, who the Father chooses, who the Father draws to him, will come. And, and in a very real sense, we don't know who the Father is drawing. How do you know if God's drawing you this morning? Do you see your soul? Do you see the state that it's in? And do you see Jesus as your salvation? Do you see those two realities? your soul needs a savior and that Jesus is, is here to save. Do you see Jesus walking across the water in the midst of the storms while you're in the boat rowing as hard as you can and you invite him in, invite him to be with you? Let's pray. Lord, you are our Christ. You are our Savior. Um, you see us in all of our, all the ways that we need you every day, all the ways that we get distracted. You see us run from you every day and run to other things, and yet you pursue us anyway. Lord, thank you. Um, I pray that you would Give us eyes to see that we would know our need for you and that you that we would know your love for us. Or I pray that you would reach out to each person here. Um, you would help them to walk with you this week. Um, I just ask that you would be with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, our final hymn is number 647, How Sweet the Name of Jesus Sounds. We'll, we'll be uh, singing verses 1 through 4. Please be with everyone in this room. Uh, please bless them and keep them. Um, please uh, just walk with them daily. In Jesus' name, amen.